Hello and welcome to the brand new American Reformation podcast. We long to see the wider American Christian church fall more in love with Jesus by learning from the practices of the early church and other eras of discipleship multiplication. We want to hear from you. Make sure you comment and leave a review wherever you're watching or listening to tell us what God is doing in your life or how you feel about today's conversation. Lord, have your way in us. Let's dive in. Welcome to the American Reformation Podcast. Tim Allman here. I pray wherever you're receiving this today, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. The peace that surpasses understanding that flows from Jesus, the crucified and risen one, is yours. And you have hope that cannot be stopped. Hope right now that's realized in the resurrected Jesus and hope for the day when he returns to make to make all things new. I pray that you just want to learn, humbly learn to follow the humble sacrificial savior to learn today with me and my guest and new friend, uh, Peyton Jones. I got to tell you about this guy in ministry for 30 years, uh, has been in a number of different Jesus confessing denominations. He's been in mega rural collegiate. He's planted churches out of Starbucks. He is a serial church planner. And uh, I am so pumped that you get to meet him today. His his ministry right now is called New Breed Training, uh, newbreedtraining.org, and he's endorsed by Alan Hirsch, who Peyton has also been a guest on the American Reformation podcast. He uses trainers like I love Ralph Moore, uh, one of the greatest living serial church planners as well. Uh, the organizations that uh, New Breed serves are collaborating to start, f- the, now just lean into this, to start five new churches a day internationally. Uh, praise God. Peyton is a church planner and author, and his more recent book is called Church Plantology, The Art and Science of Planning, Planning Churches. Thanks so much for hanging with me today, Peyton. How you doing, brother? Doing fantastic, man. It's so good to be here. Yeah, it's a joy. Honor is mine. So a standard opening question for this podcast. As you look at the wider landscape of the church here in the United States of America, I think you've got a pretty good understanding of what the Holy Spirit is is doing. How are you praying for reformation in the American Christian church? That's a really good um, question. And actually, I've been thinking about it quite a bit. I have two loves, the scripture and mission. And my worlds often collide because I uh, do something called Through the Word, which is like 10 minute audio guides, every chapter of the Bible. Uh, that's my day job. And I think my moonlighting job is is new breed or vice versa. We've never figured it out. It's just I I get to do two things, which is pretty cool. But, so cool. you know, the, the reality is reformation precedes revival, you know, and it always has in church history. Um, as soon as people go back to the grace, they go back to the cross, they experience the resurrection, they get the power, grace and power, two sides of the same coin. So I have actually been praying that through the scripture engagement ministry that we do, uh, we're number four on you version right now, which is nice. kind of cool because you version's number one. They won't let you be number one. But uh, <laughs> but then beyond that, um, man, I would just love to see. Uh, people just falling down in front of Christ. I mean, that's what it's all about and worshiping him. So I'm definitely praying for that. And I think brother, we, uh, people are desperate enough where that might, we might be ready to see something like that. Isn't that right? And one of the big goals, as I was just sharing before we hit play is for this podcast is that our tribe, the Lutheran church, Missouri synod would have the humility to, to, be aware of what the Lord is doing in the wider church. I think Lutheranism, and I know you roll in some Lutheran circles as well. Um, Lutheranism like is centered on the scripture. And when Mm. you're centered on, on the scripture, you can't help but see, Oh my goodness. It's about, the the mission of God. It's about making it's about making Jesus known. Some people actually uh, counter Luther and say Luther wasn't into into mission. Nothing could be further from the truth. He just recognized that 500 years ago, Reformation had to precede revival. Um, yes. Anything more historically? Uh, as you look at, are you a history guy? I'm a big history guy. As you oh, look at the movements of guy. the church, yeah. As you look at the movements of the church here in the United States of America, in particular, over the last, you know. 250 years or so, give us some touch points where you could say there was a reforming work of God that then was followed by revival. Anything top of mind there, Peyton? 
Yeah, I think, um, gosh, man, if I go to to, to church history, um, it, it doesn't matter if it's the 1857, 1859 revival that, uh, you know, um, that one started in Wales. It was people mm-hmm. rediscovering the gospel, right? I always think of it as kind of like Indiana Jones, you know, he... Mm-hmm. He's he's in the well of souls. He uncovers it. You know, the they move the stone that air burps out a little bit. And then, you know, there you go. And I feel like when we're recovering the gospel, we're recovering uh, Christ centeredness. When we're recovering those kinds of things, then it's it's going to unleash the power of God, because that's what the Holy Spirit gets behind the Holy Spirit. There are promises where he says, go do these things and I will be with you. Like, Mm -hmm. but when we find ourselves busy doing other things, uh, no, that's, that's, that's not what he's going to do. And interestingly enough, uh, my book plantology actually has church history as one of the three overlapping circles of, if you want to find a timeless principle from the new Testament for church planning, um, you, you, you look at three things, scripture, global missional world practice. And the third one is church history. And the reason why is if it's in the scripture, in other words, the apostles did it, Jesus modeled it. And then you find that still working today, like in Tibet, Southeast Asia, South America, um, these places where you think, oh, that that must be a hard place to reach. If it's in scripture and it's effective there today, then surely you would imagine that in times past where kingdom expansion was kicking it into high gear, you would expect to see that same principle. And lo and behold, we do. You can go back to the Reformation. You can go back to, you know, uh, Calvin in Geneva. You can go back to um, 1904-05 revival. You can go to the Jesus movement. Um, yeah. These are all vastly different movements in church history. And yet these movements were catalyzed by what? A return to the gospel. That's it. That's it, man. It's uh it's so fascinating that the church, and we'll stay at like 30,000 feet here. We'll get super practical in this chat today. But um, the church has this propensity over time. And I don't think it's the way of Jesus, but it, it can be to a certain proportion uh, that we want to overly order what the Holy Spirit is doing. And when revival comes or even reformation preceding revival, there has to be this kind of shakeup of the of the Holy Spirit. I've looked at um, hmm. the, the triune God as the father is the creator. Right. I mean, he is the orderer. Then you've got the Holy Spirit that's like the wind or a a crazy goose, you know, with his head cut, just running all around doing all these crazy things. And then you've got the uniter kind of. Yes. Connected to the father, listening to the voice of the father, but also is attuned to the work of the Holy Spirit and recognizes that his work is to get the Holy Spirit out. It's going to be I mean, this is the audacity from John 13 to 17, the high priestly prayer. It's going to be better for you if I go like you're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The comforter is going to come to you. You got to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think a lot of times the church, even today. And again, I'm in a denomination a couple hundred years old. There are some structures that have hampered the movement of the Holy Spirit. So we become overly ordered um, and there needs to be a shakeup. This is not a shakeup of doctrine at all. It's a shakeup of of maybe the shackles. We used to do it this way. And now, oh, my goodness, the Holy Spirit is moving in different places. And we we're holding on. We're holding on. Can we just like release? I think surrender the appropriate understanding of surrender to the work of God, the mission of God that is beyond us. This should be the call for us uh, today. But man, it gets messy, Peyton. It gets super messy. So any any uh, response to kind of the juxtaposition or maybe two sides of the same coin of the triune God's work with order and chaos? Yeah, you know, uh, it's funny because um, one one of the things that, that we think is really important is to note that that ministers and pastors, I don't know why this is, but they tend to be faddish and trendy. So, you know, they'll pick up the latest book and they'll be like, oh, I got to go do that. And that's great. You know, that that's what the Lord did through someone else. And unfortunately, we start grabbing on to the, the latest model or the, you know, the purpose driven this or that, which I'm not against other people's models at all. But but what 
What we're trying to get people to understand is their principles, which are timeless. That means that you could, you could plant anywhere with anyone at any time, right? Those three circles speak to those three elements. So we wanted something that was, you know, rather than borrowed models, something that you knew, like you could seek your teeth into, like this isn't faddish or transient. It's, it's eternal. Like these are things God just gave us. If we yeah. operate by these principles, then we could not necessarily borrow someone's model, but maybe discover our own models because there is a fun, like when you talk about, Hey, this is the way we did it. That was someone's model and praxis back then that might have been the most contextualized best way to do it then. And as long as our principles are timeless, then our methods can change because as a missionary and I, I train missionaries and right now we're in 72 countries. I've got a podcast called the church plantology podcast. And we interviewed planners from all over the world. Sometimes they're in the underground church. Mm. Um, we might call them planter X, you know, but we, we have one guy, he, he picks people up and he drives them around in his city in the middle East. Um, picks up four people uh, in his little car and drives them around and spends an hour worshiping, praying, discipling, talking to them through scripture, and then drops them off. That's how he disciples both non-believers and believers. Then he drops them off, picks up another group and just does that all day because that's the only way they call it car church. But that's the only way he can do it and stay alive. And stay on the move and not get caught because it's so dangerous. Most Middle Eastern countries, um, like you know Iran, Iraq, you have to um, you have to pretend you're having a birthday party and move it around and have it at different times of the week in different buildings and sing happy birthday and keep the actual worship quiet. Well, for him, it's too dangerous where he's at to do that. So these are the kinds of things right now that that I'm experiencing, and God has really allowed me to have a front row seat to. And it's those stories that, that right now inspire me. Like, Lord, these are the heroes that you honor in revelation, those souls under the altar. I'm, I'm training guys that, um, they escaped the Nigerian massacre. They're now in Cameroon training. And unfortunately in Africa, we've exported our methodology of like stadium crusades to them. Mm -hmm. So these people have no money are over there, you know, watching the, just the, the nonsense that comes off the television in America, religious television. Um, and they're trying to do these crusades and they're being used by a lot of the false teachers on, on those stations who are, um, showing video, not really doing anything to help them, but these poor people, man, that's, that's how they're doing it. And when we're getting these people, they're like, this is a game changer, how you're training us to do this stuff. Like this changes everything for us. We don't want to do the stadium crusade, but that's all we've known. Yeah. Well, dude, <laughs> my mind was, is blown about car church. I just can't, you know, and the Lord is at work in and through, in and through suffering. Like for a second, I was like, is he an Uber driver? But no, people are actually, people are actually coming, knowing they're coming to worship. Yeah. In this place at this time for this length of time with him where two or more are gathered there, there I am, or four or more in a car there, there I am. And that's, that's extraordinary. So I'd love to just go deeper in terms of the church planning principles. And you, I know I probably have a lot of them, but if you would give us kind of the core principles that you're, you're kind of training orients around. Yeah. The, I mean, the first one, you know, a lot of times people will say, man, I picked up your book and you just punched me in the face. Chapter one, because the, the first thing I tell people is, hey, most of the stuff I could give you 162 steps to take uh, from conception to birth of a church plant. But it, you know, all those things, none of them is wrong, but we know how it is. Right. Like, Tim, we we say, oh, you know, gather uh uh, a bunch of people so that you can attain critical mass on your launch day, gather a butt ton of money, get a flashy uh, website, a sexy church logo, uh, for some reason, some name that begins with R, uh, and then, you know, launch your church. <coughs> and then and then the problem is uh, that is more about gathering a crowd rather than penetrating one. So what, what we do is we say, look, 
We're not saying don't do any of those things, but don't focus on that. Like uh, the, the most disturbing thing to me is that we could train planners and they still can't do anything that we witnessed the apostles doing in the book of Acts. Um, they don't know how to make a disciple. Let me say that line over in case you, I, I'm getting over a cold, Tim. So yeah, you're good, baby. <laughs> you're good. I get that. <laughs> let me, uh, let me just tickle, say, dude, that's like the preacher's worst nightmare. Remember, I you're, know, you're, right? you had tickle. I need some water. It's all good, but it's all good. I so, apologize yeah. to your editor. No, you're good. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, they don't know how to make a disciple. So yeah. what, what we tend to do is we tell them, look, this is church planning. What you've been doing or have been taught to do is church starting. Church starting is fine, but it's a whole different, you know, uh, frame of reference. You're wanting to do something that that leverages sustainability and this and that. When you church plant, it never fails. Here's why. Um, you sow the seeds of the gospel. You water through discipleship like car church and you reap a gathering of a community, a faith community centered around Jesus. That's what Paul's says, you know, I sowed and other watered and someone else reaped and uh, no other foundation can be laid than Christ. Right. So he's not even church planning. We will teach people like, hey, you church start. You've already got the cart before the horse. Do those other things. And church planting is like reaping. It's a result of the other stuff. And that's just a game changer for people when they hear that, because often Tim training planners, I'll hear them say, Oh, you know, my church plant, we had 40 people and then it failed. I'll be, whoa, 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 back up there, uh, Kimasabi. You had 40 people and it failed. Like what happened? They're like, well, you know, we couldn't reach sustainability. I, I need to go get a job. I'm like, whoa, 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 you know, Paul planted while he worked with his hands, right? Like, like that was a little too soon. Maybe you should have a team. You should, that's another thing, team planting, bivocational sustainability um, for a season because mission dictates model, mission dictates methods. But we'll tell people, hey, um, your church plant didn't fail. Your finances failed, your personal, because you tied them to the mission and you shouldn't have done that. So we're trying to teach people, hey, if you can gather 40 people on mission, you've done something really cool. And let's be frank, uh, micro churches are less than 7% of the number of churches in the States. And that's probably a good thing. Community churches are where the fire's at for this next generation. So I, I hope people begin to see the potential of community church because that's, that's what people are aching for right now. So that, that's so good make a disciple, be discipled, make a disciple. I want to get into team planning and bivocational, but you hear a lot about micro church, um, you know, unique bivocational expressions of the gospel really for us in our context, it's like a small group with the sacraments and preaching yeah. teaching going on. Right. Uh, so talk about community church. That's a new phrase probably for many Lutherans to, to hear. Uh, talk about why people are craving for community church and how do you, how you define that? Yeah, community church would be the average size church, which is less than 85 people. 80. And, okay. yeah. you know, I, I tend to think, because um, 90% of churches in America are, are under, you know, 85, 100. 85%. Yeah. yeah, like 85 people. Or, or, uh, sorry. Yeah, less than 100, but but the average size is 85 people. So when you see that, you go, oh, so uh, it, case in point, there's a young family, you know, they're millennials or what have you. They're, they're having a kid and they they think, man, you know, we really need to, to get to know people and other parents. And where are they going to go? Well, they could do a meetup. They could go to a park group. And a lot of people do that. But there's kind of a if they're going to go to a church. They're not going to go to the big machine because something that that's true of people right now is that they are spiritually hungry, but organizationally cynical. Mm. So right. that means when they just find something that's not trying to be something big, they can find a place like cheers. You want to go where everybody knows you. Sorry, I'll stop saying it, but you know, no, no, you know no. where that's going, yeah, where everybody yeah. knows your name, knows name. where yeah. their kids grow with your kids. Um, you, you, you know, you go through the same pains and struggles and you can actually get to know people. 
um, the, the, the rule that says you can't really sustain more than 150 relationships, that's a real thing. Yes, it is. And so when they go to a community church, that's what they want. They want to be able to uh, just find in. And that's the average church out there. Now, the problem with micro church, the way that we've been teaching micro church is that we're teaching people that it's a model. So now your community church pastor is like, well, I guess I guess I'm out now. But it was never a model. I mean, like I said, these things resurge throughout church history. What did Luther do? Table talk, right? Let's That's get right. together. Let's have a pint of beer. Let's talk. Let's do discipleship. And that was table talk. Wesley, down the road, uh, had the bands or societies. Like he would come through preaching the gospel. People would come to faith. He would say, there's these little groups here. It's like soul care, right? Discipleship groups. Now you got microchurch and we're trying to pretend it's something new. No, it's just a resurgence of something that was in the New Testament. They met uh, centralized and decentralized temple courts and house to house, Acts 542. That's right. Now we see um, for this, if I tell that, that community church pastor and I say, hey, uh, you've actually been sold a, a bill of goods here. Microchurch is not a model. It's a function. Wesley stayed an Anglican and within Anglicanism said, hey, I'm just going to start these little groups. Tie your local parish with these little groups. Um, go there, get the sacraments, get all that. But here you can get discipleship. Mm. Um, that was lacking. And what I see for anyone, a, L- a Lutheran pastor, I love Lutherans, by the way. What I see is I see... Um, that you could literally embrace it as a practice. Mm -hmm. And now you've turned your people loose on mission. Like here's the example of a micro church. It's a, it's an affinity. It's a mission based affinity group. So when people say, what is it? It's a worshiping community on mission is how uh, Sanders defines it. But here's the deal. Like, let's say you have a reading group and there's some book out there that people keep talking about that, the five people you meet in heaven or Dan, Dan Brown, Da Vinci code back in the day. Um, you do reading group on those kinds of books, uh, somewhere like your local bookshop, you are going to be engaging people on the front lines of mission, having conversations with them. That is what I, it's your people on mission doing the things they love. This isn't rocket science, Peyton. It seems no. like it seems just as you go, as you're living your life, as God has put certain passions in your world, invite other people to come alongside and do it together. I love that definition of mission-based affinity groups for um, what micro churches actually are. In our congregation, we have because we're a larger Lutheran, whatever. I I don't believe that the future is churches that worship in one location, eight hundred to a thousand or plus. You know, I. It's it's gonna take the hundred and I, I there's a core here of about 150 missionaries that we know we've identified that are leaders. If I could snap my fingers right now and say, go out like you can come to the gather the larger gathering to receive word of sacrament. That's that's great. I'm not downplaying it, but this is catalytic for your life on mission. Uh, yeah. In your various vocations, this is very Lutheran, by the way, in your various vocations, yes, uh, vocation. wherever people, it's all vocational, wherever people are, um, they're starving for the gospel. They need, they need Jesus. And we can train you to talk about him in very natural ways, connected to the the master narrative of scripture. We can do all that sorts. of. so that's what our congregation is kind of leaning into with the ULC, this podcast, it exists to just give people permission. Um, you don't have to have degrees. You know, I think a lot of times we've outsourced discipleship to the professionals. I don't I shouldn't say a lot of the time, like for Lutherans, because of our elevated and I would say in many respects, over elevated understanding of the office of holy ministry and people that you have to do four years plus of training, actually eight years of undergrad and then all this kind of stuff, pre-seminary, pro, then you're actually the, the master disciple. Mate. You can go through all of the training, Peyton. Here's the crazy thing and never be discipled. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'd never be in a discipleship relationship. So uh, why would we expect our churches not to look like just come and get, just come and receive, just I'm a purveyor of religious services, but I, I've never come underneath or very rarely come underneath a spiritual father and mother to say, okay, young man, you've got a lot of, a lot of skills. You've got a lot of, a lot of head knowledge. 
but let me shape your heart after the heart mm. of Christ. Like those men and women are actually in our churches. Yes. But they're, I don't know that we're elevating them, respecting them as well as we, we will, I think, by the Spirit's power into the future. Any response to, to that? Yeah. I mean, you know, Jesus says when you go into somewhere, you know, find the person of peace. That's well, it. each of our congregations, you actually have a person of peace in there somewhere. Oh, You've got sure. someone who's connected to your community in some way, shape or form. You Maybe they're, they're in a rotary club. Maybe they're... Um, a librarian like that is the center of your community, believe it or not. Libraries are one of the one of the most underappreciated community hubs on the planet. But you have um, you have people that are the people of peace. But what we do is we say, oh, I'll leave it to the professionals. Well, in the New Testament, the professionals leave. That was the problem. You know, the apostles planted, raised up elders and took off. So Paul replaces them with people who do ministry. Right. And so, um, you know, if Jesus told us to go make disciples and we're, we're not doing that, that that's kind of a problem because the great commission, right. It's not just make disciples. People kind of, uh, you know, it's one of five and make disciples go as one. So are you going? Are you making disciples? Are you baptizing? That's the evangelism component. Are you are you seeing people translate from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love? Uh, shepherding, are you giving people soul care? Not just making an appointment with my secretary, but what Tim just said, like taking someone under your wing and mentoring them. Are you reproducing? Is it, who's your Timothy? Who's your Barnabas? Who's your Paul, right? Like who are you, who's mentoring you? Who's your... Your, your fellow nut, you know, mm-hmm. next to you that is is as crazy as you are. And and you guys mutually encourage one another. And then who's under, who's coming up under you? Um, yeah. I, I I will say this as a as a serial church planner. I remember uh, years ago, I I'm baptizing and we're we baptize in Long Beach um, in the ocean and I'm baptizing and, and each time I'm baptizing, like this guy, he, he, you know, he had been in prison for 18 years and, uh, he, just radical. I mean, everyone we baptized that day, just about had a radical past and, um, it was a rough church plant in an urban context. And this guy's coming up out of the water and I could not shake the thought that that was my next church planner. And then I baptize the next one. And I've just got this thought, and I don't think it's my thought. That's your next church planner. And I'm I'm kind of thinking, okay, this is that guy's not my next church planner. That can't be my next, you know, it's kind of like Samuel. Surely this is not the one the Lord has selected. <laughs> and and the more uh, what I felt was happening was I believe that God was placing a burden on my heart because this was a conclusion. If I discipled each one of these, it's like my fire lady. Each one of these could be a church planner, That's right. but I, it's going to, I would have to pour into them and mentor them. And what we often do is we choose the people that we think I should spend my time with. Like, for example, I used to wait for people to read Charles Spurgeon. And then when they came to me geeking out on Spurgeon, I'm like, oh, Surely this is the one. This is the one I need to pour my time into. This is the Lord's anointed. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus picked all the rejects who did not uh, study enough to make continue their ministerial training. He just picked all the rejects and losers and said, I'm going to pour into you guys. And, uh, you know, go, go down to the docks. Find those roughnecks that are chopping fish heads off, you know, up in the harbor Go pick a, a handful of them like Jesus did and go go pull a my fair lady because that's exactly what Jesus did. He picked 12 and he sh- he made them into ministers. They weren't born ministers. He made them into ministers by discipling them. Uh, hey, dude, that's so nails. Um, I think very practically, why did Jesus do that? Now, obviously, he's, he's God and his ways are higher than our ways, but I think it if you kind of pull back the curtain of Jesus discipleship strategy, it's so that, and this is deeply theological. It's so they would have no, um, no one from the outside 
would look at this group of guys, even Paul included, and say, wow, they're they're pretty impressive people. Yeah. <laughs> like, there was no way they could take responsibility for what the Holy Spirit was going to do. You know, and even yeah. even they, they had to they had to go and wait because you guys are still far <laughs> like you've experienced resurrected reality with me. But there's still some like dots that need to connect. You're thinking a uh, little small, still too narrow about the expansion of the kingdom of God being for Israel through his, you know, this kind of thing. No, no, no. My love is for the entire world. And you're going to be, you know, my witnesses, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth, etc. So, uh, man, I, it's so good. The leadership style of Jesus. I would just pray for pastors. We got a lot of pastors that listen to this, right? That the pastor or church leader would have the eyes, just pray, have the eyes for the least expected people in your midst, women and men, that if they were, because here's what I've noticed, there's a hunger with that group. Will someone see me, notice me, uh, care for me and and maybe come alongside me enough to cast vision that's beyond me that I could be a part of God's grand love story. Like that's insane. You know, I, yeah. when, when that happens and I got so many examples here in our congregation right now, and now a lot of guys are saying, Did, was I chosen because <laughs> no, 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 no. we're not looking at, but you were open to it. You were open to it. We, we knew it wasn't going to be about you. There was a humility that was there in, in those leaders in our context right now. And I think that's what it's exactly what you're talking about. It's just a humility of Christ. It's all about making him him known. So I'd like to we're coming down kind of the last quarter or so of our of our chat. I've hardly touched on on much, man. You're you're awesome. Um, I'd love to hear about your four different training pathways that New Breed <laughs> offers. Uh, your discipleology, reachology, teamology, hubology. So just give us a little bit of an overview um, of your training, and I love. Love all of those ologies, by the way. That's yeah. Funny. No, thanks for thanks for asking about that. We it's funny. Right before this podcast, I actually finished up um, the second cohort in discipleology, which will be my next book. As it turns out, I found out from Zonderman. Um, but uh, you know, for years I've been training planners out of the Book of Acts, and um, the the three. The reason you're, there's four is Paul's three missionary journeys. Uh, make up the plantology training, which again, based out of Acts, first missionary journey is reachology. He and Barnabas go home. They go to Cyprus, where Barnabas was from, and then they go to Turkey, where Galatia is, where Paul was from. Um, Paul's from Tarsus in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So they both go back to their their home, and there's only two of them. But of course, the Galatian heresy happens. Mm -hmm. So uh, success, Paul's not sure when he writes mm -hmm. Galatians. So when he says, hey, let's go back and strengthen them, we always make that sound really pretty. That wasn't pretty. He's saying they're a wreck. We have to go fix them. And so this time, what Paul does on a second missionary journey is he starts recruiting like crazy. First missionary journey was just him, John Mark, and Barnabas. John Mark goes home. So there's only two of them. Paul goes, right, that has to change. I have to be able to leave people behind. So Paul starts training up a network, uh, 32 named individuals on that second missionary journey that he pulls out, that he calls his fellow workers. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he learns team leadership. So that's why the second year of our plantology uh, training is teamology. And, and so that reachology in that first year, just to reach the people like that's planner training 101. But if you want to start multiplying and all, by the way, all mature living beings multiply, all mature churches multiply. Um, your church isn't really mature until it's multiplying. Now, that might be the most controversial thing I'll say on this podcast. But the reality is that uh, Paul knew he needed te to start creating teams to multiply. And so the biggest bottleneck to multiplication is leadership pipeline. So that's what we see Paul doing. He's training others like crazy, but then he spends a lot of time in prison and he's on the run from the circumcision group. So on his third missionary journey, he does something he's never done before. He stays put. See, he's always spent about three or four months on average going from place to place. Now he spends three years in Ephesus. This becomes the hub of the New Testament, not Rome. It's, it's Ephesus. Paul's never been to Rome, by the way, when he writes Romans. 
Um, but look at chapter 16. You see all the people he trained uh, over those years, what we just talked about. He has a whole chapter of people he greets yep. in a city he's never been to. Like that is mind blowing in itself. But what Paul does is he lectures daily in the Hall of Tyrannus, creates a hub and the networks. There are seven networks that Paul plants in the New Testament. A lot of people think Paul planted churches. He actually planted networks and Jesus honors one of those churches, seven churches of Asia. That's a network that came out of Ephesus. That's why Ephesus is mentioned first. That's the hub church. Paphroditus plants two of those churches, by the way, um, Colossian and other. Um, so you look at that and you think, okay, so there's a network. That's why people today uh, are talking about microchurch networks. Um, and then we realized as well, okay, um, I was talking, I'll, I'll just, sorry, this is a long answer, but I love this. I, we realized we had to go back to the gospels and look at what Jesus was doing to train the 12 for acts because I'm starting in the wrong spot. So recently I was at a meeting with um, the vice president of a very large denomination. I often will find myself in these meetings. People come to us because of the book and some of our training uh, and they'll, they'll say, we help us. So we build a lot of people's training. We actually built Alan Hirsch's MX platform, built stuff for Surge. We've built um, new things, reproducing churches, catalysts. So we, we typically will build, um, help build it for the Southern Baptist. God help me. But <laughs> I knew, I knew that's where you're going. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yep, but, yep. but anyways, I'm sitting in this, in this meeting and they said, our mission is to plant and our goal, 10 year goal. We're going to plant 10,000 churches. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 33,000 churches in the next 10 years. Okay. And I'll just be honest with you, Tim, like there aren't 33,000 church planners out there today. So <laughs> they're just uh, not there. It's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. How, so how are we going to do that? We have to, we have to make them. Mm -hmm. Well, how are we going to do that? We'll go back to the gospels. What was Jesus doing there? He was making something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. He was taking people who were not ministry hopefuls and he was crafting his core team right for the church in jerusalem he was making disciples he was teaching them to do four things uh become disciples make disciples gather and scatter disciples on mission those four things are what that's what we train in discipleology those four things if you could take like jesus did a 15 year old because it's got to come from young people right now if we're not going to reach our young people, it doesn't matter. I don't care what your strategy is to turn things around. If it doesn't have young people in it somehow, some way, shape, or form, it's not going to matter. Ten years is all you got, right, of road. Mm -hmm. It has to start with young people. That's why renewal, revival always starts with young people. Reformation and revival usually happens with young people, and that's where everything catalyzes. So all that to say – um, what what we've been doing is doing a deep dive of Jesus's disciple making, um, wondering what would it be like to take a 15 year old kid, teach him to make a dis or teach him to become, teach him to make. What well, could you make one disciple? Well, what if after that you gathered them on mission? Like what we talked about earlier, something that looks and feels like a micro church. We don't use those terms, but then could you teach them to scatter, go pick a fight with some in their community? When young people get busy doing that stuff, you have your church planner. By the end of that process, to become, make, gather, and scatter, you've got your core. You've got church planners. You you just don't tell them they're church planners. You wait for that leadership to emerge like Jesus did. He picked his 12 second year in because he had a lot more disciples to choose from. And that that's where you're going to get your tomorrow's leaders from. Mm. Oh, there's so much there. Yes. Yes. Uh, young people couldn't agree more. We got to focus on on the young. I love the simplicity. Become, make, gather and, and scatter. I want to I want to come back to what you said is the most controversial statement that healthy churches multiply or something along those lines. Um, there are some in our so in our in our denomination, I've written about this extensively, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. There is very little 
So shout out to the Southern Baptists. At least they're like dreaming big dreams. Thirty three thousand. I mean, that's that's praise praise God, right? That, that's a stretch. <laughs> that's a stretch goal to be sure. But we don't we don't necessarily hear that um, right now. It's more of inward protect. Uh, it's it, there's more talk around purity. But there is a, a group called Set Apart to Serve in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod that is focusing, starting to focus on raising up young leaders, working with the guts of what we have is catechesis, you know, con- confirmation normally between fifth and eighth grade. Uh, then a lot of times they move into high school and beyond. And we just kind of lament. I think one of the biggest struggles is, Peyton, we're, we're not continuing to cast vision for young people to become and to make and to gather and to then, you know, release a network. I, I think if we cast that vision for our 15, you know, to high schoolers, basically, um, I got three of them, by the way, right now in my house, uh, 17, 15 and 14, that man, wouldn't that be, they, they would lean into that, that call of the yeah. Holy Spirit. They are, they are hungry today. So like if you're, if you're listening and you're that average, average church of 80 or so work from a place of strength, not scarcity. If you're 50 people, fine, like work from a place of strength, identify the young people who are in your midst and cast vision for them to be a part of And you, I love that you're not using the word church planner. You're just saying you're going to come and hang out with me. We're going to do life together. You're going to help me do the I do, you help, I do, uh, and then you start to do, and I watch and give you feedback and all that kind of continuum. If more pastors and church leaders just had that sort of intent, if elder groups had that sort of intent with the next generation, man, churches would, you could not hold back the Holy Spirit moving no. right now if he cast vision for for the next next gen. So I'm praying for big, bold vision from LCMS leaders to move from that next gen of leaders. We're going to start churches then. As these leaders come up, the reason I'm doing, I'd love to hear your origin story. The reason I'm doing what I do is because in those formative years, and it was about 15, I had people that had the ICNU conversation. Tim, you yep. love people. You love talking about Jesus. Yeah, you got a crazy dad that's talking about Jesus all the time, but it's more its more than that. I, I see something in you. If we just had more of those I see in you conversations with the young people, man, the church would be so much healthier right now, and you could not stop churches from starting into the next generation. Anything more to add on on the need to cast big vision, especially in engaging the young, the young in our midst, Peyton? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the catechesis, and I, I do. I actually have Luther's catechism sitting back uh, behind me on that desk, you can see. Um, the uh, the guy that I trained planners with for years is a guy named John Allwood, and he is a Lutheran and working here in Southern California. One of my best friends, one of my top three best friends. And he, he is currently part of a, a catechism class with junior hires. And man, I love like when we get together and obviously we have a good beer together. um, Mm -hmm. He I love hearing him talk about those classes and he sees exactly what I'm saying because we've trained planners for so many years and he's planted multiple churches. Um, It's just been it's been one of these things that we think this is what God's going to do in the future if the church leans into it. I, I don't think I'm alone in this. I always have this theory. If God's speaking to one knucklehead, he's probably Mm -hmm. speaking to a bunch of them at the same time. I think I think he's speaking to a bunch of us about this right now. Like, hey, we have the person of peace in our congregation right now. It's that young person. Um, God typically grabs hold of people while they're young and starts using them. I I think we've been given up, to be frank, on the next gen. Just just like right before the Jesus movement. Then God just said, you know what? I haven't. Boom. Yeah. And there it went. Exactly. Let's, man, let's pray for more of that today to be sure. Um, you, you, if you're talking with Alan Hirsch, rolling in those circles, Ralph Moore, last question or two here. <laughs> APEST comes up consistently. Uh, give us a biblical understanding and maybe even a defense because there are may, many people, sure. maybe a, that are more conservative, Lutherans, et cetera, that kind of, don't like a pest at all. Don't think sure. it's helpful. Um, they, well, it's been abused. One, yeah. Talk, talk about the story of a pest, how it's been abused and how yeah. it should be used. I mean, people have used it as some kind of weird hierarchical thing. Like you've got, yeah. um, people that call themselves apostles and this and that, right. you know, I've, I've kind of really changed 
uh, I started to see, like, I would say Luther had a strong apostolic bent in him. You know, he, sure. w- he was a catalytic. I see apostolic as like a catalytic um, missionary, really. You, you just new frontiers. You, you take the church where it hasn't been before. You mobilize it out on mission. It can be small scale. It can be large, and as in the case of Luther and others. Um, but you, you know, Wesley, he wasn't a pastor. What was he? He was something else. And I I would say he was more apostolic, but I've moved away from thinking of those as people. I've started to think of them as function. So when, when Ephesians four talks about the, the gifts kicked down to the church, it was the five functions of Christ's ministry. Yeah. Uh, Do we, are we missionaries? Yes. Are we the prophetic presence and power of God on earth? Yes. The church is that. Um, are we the keeper of the secret things of God, a.k.a. the gospel? Yes. Are we uh, those that um, can shepherd people's souls? Yes. Are we those who teach and show people the wisdom, the timeless wisdom of God through his word? Yes. Those are the functions to fill the world with Christ himself. So when people read it as God gave apostles, prophet, and they see that as like a leadership role, I, I, I at one time thought that. I now think, no, 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 no. That is the function of the church as the gift given to the church to do the five things Jesus did that the ch- through the church, God's plan A, there is no plan B, Christ might fill all things. That's why kingdom expansion happens. So these are five functions. We believe in these five functions, teaching, shepherding, being the prophetic voice, heralding the gospel and going on mission. Nobody should have a problem with these functions, right? The problem is when we create a role out of them and say, you are the apostle, you are the the prophet, then it gets weird. And it's not good exegesis anyways. But those five functions must be leaned into if we're going to accomplish the mission of Christ. Yes, dude. So good. And those functions have been given to the church uh, for for her stewardship of all of the unique gifts that are found within the body of Christ. This is 1 Corinthians 12, Romans chapter 12. Uh, where would we be without one another uh, who have the role of these respective, the gifting of these respective functions? And it's not necessar- it's not the office. There is the office of, of ministry that has been given to the church. And, yeah. and yet you still have leaders that have yeah. differing gifts, right? For sure. Yes. Like one leader might be more a teacher, one more a shepherd, one more a missionary. Like I'm a missionary. You put me some, I'm going right. to catalyze right. mission wherever I go. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And can we respect one another who have these unique gifts? And if Amen. you happen to be ordained as a pastor, just to respect uh, those that are different than us. That's some, my one heart cry that we would see different as beautiful rather than uh, the enemy of of the mission of the church. We need all parts of the body of Christ and all sizes of churches re- to reach all Amen. types of all types of people. Peyton, this has been so good. If people want to connect with you and your ministry, how can they do so, brother? Yeah, they can go to newbreedtraining.com. And if they want to sign up and learn April 8th, I don't know when this comes out, but April 8th, we've got a Gathering Disciples cohort that so people good. can join. And they just go to newbreedtraining.com slash gathering. We'll have it come out before April 8th, maybe a week or two before, <laughs> and see if we can get some some mission-oriented Lutherans to go on mission to multiply disciples with you. It is a good day. Go and make it a great day. Jesus loves you so much. Thanks for buckling up with us today as we had some mission training 101, no, 303, <laughs> more than that, baby. This was so, so much fun. Would love to have you back into the future. Thanks for being a partner in the gospel. Uh, Karen, for us, uh, Lutherans, are the sacramental Lutherans today that want to go on mission, Uh, with the Holy Spirit uh, to make Jesus known. The days are too short for us to divide. We have to, under the umbrella of Jesus is Lord, we have to unite um, for the sake of those who, who don't know Jesus, who are walking in darkness. We'll be back next week with another episode of the American Reformation Podcast. Thanks so much, Peyton. Thanks, brother.